This Steve Jones Show podcast is now loading. The Steve Jones Show podcast is presented by Sunbury Motor Company, Purdy Insurance, Brewers Outlet, and NIL Game Changers. Bringing you an in-depth look at Penn State sports and more. This is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. The Steve Jones Show is presented by Brewers Outlet, NIL Game Changers, Sunbury Motor Company, and Purdy Insurance. Now from the Sunbury Motor Studio, here's Steve Jones. This half hour brought to you by Brewers Outlet, Reagan Street in Sunbury. The Beverage Supermarket. Imports Domestics Microbrews, the best selection of beer anywhere. Wine coolers, water, soft drink snacks. They roast their peanuts fresh and out every day. Pickle bar led by the barrels and the dills. Indeed, second to none. All at Brewers Outlet, Reagan Street and Sunbury, the Beverage Supermarket. John Sauber does great work covering everything for the Center Daily Times. John, welcome back. Great to have you with us. Thanks for having me on, Steve. Always appreciate it. Uh, I will start with something that's actually uh, off topic. That's Penn State basketball. They did release the non-conference schedule today, uh, which includes you know game, a, lot, a lot of games we already knew about the tournament down in Daytona, which I had to set up a flight for today uh, from Minneapolis, um, and Virginia Tech down in Baltimore, which we're calling the Ace Baldwin Invitational. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but then everything else that came out, what was just your thought on what they have on there and the sequencing of it? Yeah, there were there were two main things that, that I noticed right away. One was the UMBC game the night before the whiteout at home, which I think is interesting. I don't, I honestly couldn't tell you the last time I, I had to do the old doubleheader right in two days, uh, the, the men's basketball right into a, a football game, but I thought mm-hmm. that was interesting. And then there is uh, the, the away game at Drexel on December 21st as I think everyone knows at this point that could be a potential home football weekend as well if there's a playoff game in Beaver Stadium. So I thought it was interesting that they decided to make that the weekend that they go, you know, to Wells Fargo Center and play there uh, against Drexel. Yeah, uh, that game would be at noon, by the way. The Flyers are playing that night. So yep. uh, yeah, so they'll have to turn the Wells Fargo over in order to do it. All right, so now let's get to football. Uh, in the opportunities you've had to be at practice, what has struck you? Yeah, one one of the main things that every time I go in is, is always a takeaway for me is that just how big Julian Fleming is compared mm-hmm. to a lot of other receivers, right? Like he is clearly a different type of receiver than they, they had on the roster heading into this season. Uh, it, it makes sense that they would go at him. He, you know, the physicality that, brings, that he brings, the blocking ability that he brings, but it's not just him. It's, you know, a guy like Trey Wallace stands out physically, too. He looks bigger. He looks stronger. Uh, those are the two kind of guys that I think we're all monitoring as to whether or not they can stay healthy this year. Uh, Fleming had injury issues in the past at Ohio State. Trey Wallace obviously missed a good chunk of last year. Uh, and, and I think seeing those guys physically stronger is important. Uh, but outside of that, it's, you know, we, it's limited. we're limited in what we see. But I, as always, very impressed with Drew Aller's arm strength. But it's tough to know with something like that until you see it in an 11-on-11 situation. Last week, and I've brought this up a couple of times on the show, last week Georgia Tech won. And this has nothing to do with, oh, look, Georgia Tech. That's nothing to do with it. It's the game and how they did it. Georgia Tech, big offensive line, ran the football and reduced the number of possessions. Each team only had seven possessions in the game. In other words, they shortened the game. Is West Virginia capable of that? I think West Virginia is capable of that, but I also think the the uh, way they get to their rushing attack is a little different from Georgia Tech. Uh, they're, they're not as – there was a lot of window dressing for that Buster Faulkner offense, and credit to Georgia Tech. Right. That was – frankly, I had a lot of fun watching that game uh, with some yes. of the stuff they did, some of the motions, some of the, the group shifts that they were doing. Yeah. Uh, but I don't, I don't know that West Virginia is going to play it the same way. I do think one of the – you know, advantages Penn State has is a lot of teams West Virginia plays this year is not going to have the athleticism to match up with Jaheim White, Garrett Green, C.J. Donaldson, those guys in the running game. Penn State does have that athleticism. So I don't, you know, it's it's tough for me. I've, I've 
I, I haven't really gone back and forth on my prediction for this game just because it seems like a bad stylistic matchup for West Virginia. It's one of the reasons I, I thought Penn State looked so good last year, and I, I kind of expect that to be the case again Saturday. Uh, when you look at Penn State offensively, what will be a couple of things you want to see in the first quarter and a half that will either confirm or cause pause as you move forward? I think the biggest thing is getting those playmakers the ball in space. Andy Kotonicki has harped on it all off season. It seems like everyone on staff has harped on it all off season. Uh, and it sounds simple, but seeing guys like Katron Allen and Nick Singleton get the ball in an advantageous positions, seeing Trey Wallace get the ball in advantageous position, seeing Tyler Warren utilized in a way that uh, doesn't force him to make contested catches every time, right? Like getting getting those guys in spots where even if it doesn't always turn into a big play, you see an opportunity for one if it breaks right the next time. Uh, I think that's going to be the, the biggest thing. I, I'm not overly concerned about Drew Aller. Uh, I know that has uh, been a, a talking point this offseason. I said a lot last year, too, that I don't know how much he was to blame for some of the struggles the offense had last year. Uh, I, I don't know that there's a ton he can do against West Virginia specifically just because, I mean, we saw him torch them last year. But I, I think that seeing those guys put in space is going to be the biggest thing just because that will tell, tell us how much of an impact Andy Kotelnicki is having quickly on the offense. Same question as to the first quarter and a half and what you see defensively that will confirm what you thought this defense can be or give you pause. Yeah, I don't. I, I honestly don't know that I expect to see much that'll give me pause. I, I really expect this to be a, a top five defense in the country, if not mm-hmm. like top three. Uh, the biggest thing is going to be the pressure from the edge guys. If Abdul Carter is playing the edge instead of off ball linebacker, seeing him get pressure, seeing Deny Dennis Sutton get pressure. Uh, you know, the, I guess the, the biggest question mark is probably those corners, guys like AJ Harris, Jalen Kimber, Cam Miller. Uh, a Davian Collins, seeing how they play is going to be important, but I, I tend to think that's going to be a strong point of the defense that you know I don't know that is going to have a weak point this year. Uh, so I don't know that there's a whole lot that, you know, I, I guess if West Virginia lights up the defense, I'll be concerned, but I don't know if there's going to be anything early that would be a massive indicator just because I think this defense is going to be really versatile. Uh, it's going to be able to match up really well with, a, you know, with myriad teams this year, and I think they're going to have a lot of success this year. How uh, what's your level of curiosity about helmet communication, use of iPads, and the implementation strategically of the two-minute warning? I think probably like a five, right? Like this is a, a five out of ten. Like I don't think this is going to be – especially it is funny to me that they're just now getting the iPads on the sidelines. Drew Aller mentioned this week that his high school had them. It's just very strange that high schools were ahead of, of college football in that regard, but – I think the communication is probably the most interesting part of this. The two-minute warning, I think people will get used to pretty quickly. But with the communication, you know, we've talked to coaches and everything about, you know, what is what is too much information? When are you giving the guy information overload at that point? You're kind of interfering with, with things and uh, instead of keeping it simple. I know Andy Kodonik, he said that he's basically going to get the play call in, you know, give, give Drew Aller one piece of advice like, hey, look for this or hey, look for that. And that's kind of it. So I'll be curious to see how the guys who have the green dot on their helmet handle that information. And, and if at any point it becomes too much, not just for Penn State, but I think across college football, that's going to be fascinating to watch. Yeah, I think the part about the two-minute warning, if you're saving all your timeouts, that now strategically becomes interesting to me. I mean, it's there's, it's not an additional timeout. It's the fourth timeout of the first right. half and the fourth timeout of the second half, because I can say that for because we have to take breaks on radio. Uh, based on that, so that's what it is. It's uh, just so people know it's not an addition. But I'm going to be interested to see how much people run the football in certain situations if they save timeouts because now they have the fourth one. And I'm going to see. And that's what I'm going to be watching for in some games this weekend, John. Like in certain situations, because I have the additional timeouts instead of like trying to hurry everything up, I may run the ball a couple times. I was going to say I think that is probably the scenario that it creates, right? Where there's like. You know, two minutes and five seconds left, the clock is stopped, and you don't have to throw the ball there, right? Like, does it change the play calling in those specific spots? You know, under three minutes, are you are you waiting to ramp it up, like waiting to ramp your tempo up until you get to the two-minute? Uh, I do think it'll be interesting in seeing how coaches handle that, but I, you know, 
it, it is tough because their those scenarios can be few and far between at times with that. But I do think you're right. I think there there are going to be those two to three minute, uh, you know, two three minutes left on the clock, and you're going to see someone change a strategy here or there just because of the two minute warning. Is there a player on each side of the ball that to you is a swing player as to how each side of the ball plays? Yeah, I think on offense, it's it's you know it's got to be Trey Wallace at this point. Uh, mm-hmm. It is, you know, paramount that this team has someone it can trust at wide receiver. Has a lot of weapons, but I think just having one guy that is, uh, you know, defenses have to focus on would be would be really crucial, uh, and that can really swing the season. It can take it from, you know, a potential you know nine and three, ten and two year to an eleven and one, twelve and zero year if, if they have a legitimate number one option at receiver. On defense, uh, I don't know if there's one particular guy on defense, but I think those corners as a whole are going to dictate a lot. It's it's one of the reasons I'm so high on the defense. I guess if I had to pick one, it would be A.J. Harris, just because I do think he's going to be the number one corner, and he's going to be the number one corner quickly. But as long as that group hits a certain threshold of being good, uh, then then I think this defense is going to be, like I said, top three to five. If it's better than that, it, it might be one of the you know it might be the best defense in the country. John, no divisions. It's one through eighteen. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, and what it can mean for certain programs? I think it is going to be a, a, a very big adjustment for me personally, right? Because you're so used to, you know, you picture the Big Ten, one, usually 14 teams. Obviously, that's an adjustment. Mm-hmm. Uh, sure. But you're so used to seeing, like, okay, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa, all these schools are bunched together. But there's the, the mental, like, you're, you're breaking the, uh, the muscle memory in, in some way of, like, okay, these teams are associated with this. Now we're actually going to get to see the top two teams of the conference. I think that's really exciting, for one, right? I, I think there have been too many Big Ten title games that have been uh, a little bit uh, boring in recent years just because you don't get the two best teams in the conference. Uh, I think, honestly, the, the biggest thing from, from all of this, right, not just the, the divisions going away, but the bigger conference is that I, I think we're going to see three lost teams in the playoff, and I think that's going to open the door for Penn State some years or open the door for Michigan some years. All of those teams that are kind of usually fighting on the fringes for playoff spots, I think, I think they're going to have more opportunities now than they've ever had before. Yeah, I find that that part interesting because when I was with the the Big Ten announcers, we do a golf outing every year, and it's usually near the end of May. So I asked, man, we were just sitting around shooting the BS after after telling lies about our golf games, and <laughs> and uh, I said, let me ask you something: Is eighth place good? And I thought the best answer was one of them jumped in and said, well, it depends on who you are. Like, for example, if you were a team that was 4-8 and eight last year and now you finish in eighth place, you've moved up. But if you're a blue blood, eighth place is going to be crushing. Um, yeah, I, I think there's a, a small group of teams where eighth place is never going to be good, right? I think that applies right. to Penn State, Ohio State, Michigan, Oregon, USC, those kind of programs. But I think for pretty much anyone past that, like if Wisconsin finishes eighth most years, that's that's going to be a pretty big win, right? You're you're not going to be a playoff team at that point, but it probably is. I would assume eight or nine wins in a a fringy top twenty five ranking, and I think I think most Big Ten schools would take that. Yeah, because it's a little bit different in football compared to basketball. You finish in eighth place in the Big Ten, I think you're going to the NCAA tournament. Oh yeah. If you finish in eighth place in football in the Big Ten. Uh, you're going to the ReliaQuest Bowl. Very true. I mean, I mean that's that's what I, I think it is. Um, what's the biggest question that fans have asked you uh, in the off season leading into this game? I, I uh, it's all about Andy Kotelnicki, right? Or or more broadly, the offense, right? Like, it's, is this really going to be different? Uh, is this going to be? Uh, you know the same offense just with a different play caller is it going to be something that's actually fundamentally different and you know I I know James has said often that it's a blending of what Andy does and what Penn State does but I do think we're going to see a very different product this weekend than than we saw last year and I think it's going to be something that you know all those fans asking those questions get excited about quite frankly because it is creative you know I I did a a big feature on Andy and, and kind of his journey uh, and and he like he's fascinating to me, but I think he's one of the most creative minds that I've ever interacted with. You know, when it comes to, to football coaching, and mm-hmm. and I think he's going to have this offense humming. The final question: It does deal with Andy. If you had to hand pick a non-conference opener with a new coordinator and Andy Kultanicki, ironically, it's a Big Twelve team. 
And, of course, Kansas played them all the time until they made the expansion last year. Everybody in the Big 12 played everybody all the time. So he knows them. Conversely, they know him. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that that kind of opens the door for us to actually learn something Saturday, right? I think if if we saw like a a lower level group of five school going into Beaver Stadium and losing by fifty, there's only so much to learn, right? Like Penn State, in all likelihood, knows they're winning that game. They don't have to pull out all the stops. They don't have to do things differently. But because of this matchup, both Penn State and West Virginia and Andy all have to do things that they know the others know about, right? Like. Uh, Andy has to call plays that he knows that West Virginia has seen before, and he'll have to have counters for those quickly because when they see it the first time, they'll recognize it and be able to start to adjust almost immediately rather than needing you know, more time to make those adjustments. But, yeah, I think, I think it definitely makes it much more of a chess match, and I think it, it adds a, an added layer that's going to be really exciting to watch. Always a pleasure, John. Great respect for your work, and thanks for the valuable time you gave us today. Thank you so much, Steve. Always appreciate when you have me on. John Sauber, Center Daily Times, always doing great work, and we'll come back, wrap it up in a moment, brought to you by Brewers Outlet, here on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Party time, game time, or just fun time. Doesn't matter what time it is, because it's Brewers Outlet time. The beverage supermarket has the area's largest beer selection, imports, microbrews, ciders, and domestics. Pick from over 100 ice-cold 12-packs and dozens of 24-ounce singles. Soda, snacks, hot sauces, fresh roasted peanuts. Make it one-stop party shopping, and don't forget the pickle bar. So whatever you're celebrating or just doing it up, Brewers Outlet, Reagan Street, Sunbury, wants to see you. And thank you for your years of patronage. You want a unique way to display your brand. You need a team of seasoned experts to work with. You want to reach customers who buy. You want NIL Game Changers, a versatile consulting agency powered by former student athletes and coaches who work as NIL sports agents. NIL Game Changers will help you build powerful relationships with customers through compelling stories with student athlete influencers as your leading edge. Finally, we'll equip you with the right media to drive your success home. NILGameChangers.org, building meaningful relationships with your customers. 